Greeting from the meeting house of the First Church in Oberlin, United Church of Christ, in this time of keeping faith together for a more just society. These are indeed challenging times. We are confronting a global pandemic, dealing with long-standing issues of racial injustice, confronting wealth inequality, living in a nation torn by political ideologies, and approaching a very contentious election. In this moment, let us come together with no less a spirit than those earliest settlers in Oberlin who strove to take on the challenges of their time and place. Before we hear a few words from the president of the Oberlin City Council, Linda Slocum, let us come together in prayer. Holy One, God of many names, we come before you in a very difficult time. We come before you in a time of being isolated and separated from one another. And so in these few moments, we ask that you gather us together as one community, one people. We seek your wisdom and guidance and your strength for the journey ahead. Bind us together in our commitment to a more just society in our time. Amen. Greetings. I'm Linda Slocum, the current president of Oberlin City Council and a member of First Church. I'm very happy to be part of this ecumenical event and to greet you on behalf of the city of Oberlin. People visiting or new to our small city might quickly hear two things about this town. One, that the town and college were founded at the same time and have grown up together. And two, Oberlin was built on a swamp. In a recent walk through Westwood Cemetery, I came upon a marker that says, here has been placed earth from the grave of John Friedrich Oberlin. And that reminded me that this city was named for a person who put his deeply grounded principles into practice in his daily life. He created a vibrant community known for its progressive educational reform, economic development, and spiritual regeneration. John Friedrich Oberlin's life work in Alsace, France, inspired settlers on another continent. And despite the challenges of its location, Oberlin's founders had a clear vision of what they wanted this community to become and started this settlement in that direction. In the nearly two centuries since that time, Oberlinians, although all too often falling short of their goals, have rethought, redefined, and recommitted themselves to those ideals. Now, in 2020, we are dedicating ourselves anew to working together for a more inclusive and equitable community. Thank you.
gracious God. We come today with thanksgiving in our hearts and prayers in our mouths for your love and protection in our season of pandemic and social instability. As we celebrate and give thanks for the renovation of this building, the First Church of Overland, we give thanks also for all of our houses of worship in our community. Let us also pray for the rededication and commitment of the Ecclesia, that is the people of God, from our, all of our different religious and spiritual traditions called out for service in the building of a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Dear Lord, help your people to be called the called out ones, the Ecclesia, to keep the faith and to be your shining light in the world as we struggle for a more just society in our town, county, state, country, and world. As we walk in this light, let us always struggle for justice and righteousness in our world and home. Our God, let us follow the challenge that you gave to the prophet Micah, according to the Message Bible in Micah 6.8. But he has already made it plain how to live, what to do. What God is looking for in men and women, it's, sim it's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbors. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And do not take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. I ask these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. O oh my God, O oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O oh God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily, thou art their helper and their Lord. What a shang di ya, what a shang di. Lian he ni pu yi men de xin zhe. Xiang ta men xian ming ni wei da de zhi ling. Yuan ta men feng xing ni de lu fa. Zun shou ni de jian ming. Shang di ya, bang zhu ta men nu li cheng shi. Ci yu ta men shi feng ni de li liang. Shang di ya, qie wu rang ta men gu li wu yuan. Would you please join me in prayer? O oh God of freedom and justice, divine love, and wellspring of infinite grace. With so much pain and suffering and uncertainty in the world, we give you thanks for the opportunity to keep faith together, here and now. 
gathering in new ways as one beloved Oberlin community. As pandemics rage, pandemics of coronavirus, racism, exploitation of your good creation, political sectarianism, and so much more, knit us together as your body, we pray, that we might reflect your image, embody your love, and bless all that is around us. May your Holy Spirit empower us to proclaim good news to the poor, to release captives and prisoners, and to free the oppressed according to the example of your eternal wisdom, Jesus the Christ, through whom we now pray. Amen. Greetings. I am Mary Gregolia, minister with the Oberlin Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and I invite us to join our hearts and minds in a spirit of meditation and prayer. Beloved spirit of life and of justice, opening us to the joy we feel being together in community, tasked with keeping faith with life, keeping faith with one another, living from our hearts where you guide us, opening to the sorrow we carry for those suffering from COVID-19, opening to the anger, fear, and grief we carry in response to the pandemic of white supremacy, opening to our shared commitment to equal justice for all. You hold us with your unconditional love, breathing us, inspiring us, breathing with gratitude for being together, for sharing our faith in life, shining through us, shining through the different religious and spiritual traditions that support us in keeping our hearts and minds open to your guidance, dearest spirit of life, spirit of community, spirit of justice and of peace. Help us to see beyond our differences. Help us to hear beyond our opinions. Help us to act beyond our fears. Move us toward one another in vulnerability and vision that we may become the beloved community you dream of. Guide us in praying together in deepening our trust in ourselves and in each other so that our lives and our actions may help bend that moral arc of the universe toward your dream of justice. Thank you for bringing us together. May we honor you through all we do and all we are. Amen. Good day. My name is David Kahn, and I am the pastor at First United Methodist Church here in Oberland. And I am also a proud graduate of Oberlin College, class of 1978. So I was honored and pleased to be asked to introduce the president of Oberlin College today. And I was excited when I heard that uh, Carmen Ambar had been selected as the 15th president of the college, because of her background and experience, I thought she would be a good fit for this community. She has always had an emphasis on social justice issues, and she has encouraged the students to be more engaged with the wider metropolitan Cleveland area and with the community here at Oberlin. And so she is appropriate to introduce our main speaker for the day as we gather together from many different faiths 
uh, even people of no faith, but we gather together to work for a more just society. And so now I am pleased to introduce to you President Ambar. Hello, I'm Carmen Tully Ambar, president of Oberlin College, and I'm so pleased to be a part of this signature event that brings together the faith community for this virtual, multi-faith, multi-denominational gathering of unity and optimism. We all share a belief that God is in control and that our faith should be a foundational principle that guides and lights our path. And we all benefit from gathering together in that shared commitment to encourage each other and to support each other. These gatherings are all the more important during times that are particularly challenging. As I oftentimes say, we all benefit from faith extenders, from people in the moment who help us reconnect to our faith-filled roots. That's why I'm so excited that Reverend Marvin McMickle is here to deliver this message today from Matthew, the 16th chapter, 13th to the 20th verse. Reverend Marvin McMickle was born in Chicago in 1948 and is a 1970 graduate of Aurora University, where he earned a BA in philosophy. He earned a Master's of Divinity degree from the Union Theological Seminary in New York City and completed two additional years of graduate study at Columbia University. He earned a Doctorate of Ministry degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and he was awarded a Doctorate of Philosophy degree from Case Western University in Cleveland. Dr. McMickle served as the 12th president of Colgate Rochester Coles Divinity School. Prior to joining Colgate, he was pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland. Dr. McMickle was also a professor at Ashland Theological Seminary in Ashland, Ohio. He is the author of 15 books and dozens of articles that regularly appear in professional journals and magazines. His writings also appear in Feasting on the Word and Preaching God's Transformative Justice in two recent preaching commentaries. He's a member of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Board of Preachers at Morehouse College. Dr. McMickle is currently the director of the Doctor of Ministry program at Colgate Rochester Coser Divinity School in Rochester, New York. I'm so pleased to welcome Reverend Marvin McMickle. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. May God bless unto us the reading and the hearing of this portion of God's holy and sacred word. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you now for the privilege of worship and more especially for the opportunity to share in the reading of the scripture and also in the preaching of the gospel. So be among us as we ponder this text, guiding our thoughts, uh, establishing your word in our heart that we in our day-to-day -day life may not sin against you. And grant, O oh loving God, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Building on a firm foundation. There was a story on the CBS News program, 60 Minutes, that has aired a few times over the last several years about a luxury apartment building in the city of San Francisco, California. It's a 50-story, super luxury building 
where the minimum price for a single unit is $5 million. Imagine that. Some people are so rich they can afford to buy a $5 million condominium as the entry-level cost for living in this 50-story super luxury apartment. Some of the richest people in the world are living in that building. Superstar athletes, business tycoons, high-profile entertainers from the movies and from the music industry. Some people spent their entire life savings getting just enough money to make a down payment for what they considered a little piece of paradise, 50 stories up in this super luxury apartment building. Now, the views were spectacular. From the highest levels of that building, one had a crystal clear, breathtaking view of the Golden Gate Bridge, the Pacific Ocean, the California coastline. It was, no doubt, one of the most lovely places in which to live anywhere on the face of the earth if you could afford $5 million for the lowest cost condominium in that 50-story complex. And everything was going well for those who lived there until small cracks began to appear in the basement foundation of that building. They tried to patch those cracks up with bits of metal to hold uh, the pieces of the crack together. But as time went by, the cracks not only got wider, but more numerous. And then finally, someone said, let's find out what's going on. They went to the top story of this building and they took a marble and set the marble on the floor. Now, if this building was level and even, the marble should have stayed right where it was. But instead, once the marble hit the floor, it began to roll in the direction in which this 50-story, super luxury condominium building was leaning. Come to find out, they built that building not in the bedrock of the earth, but instead took a combination of stone and sand and concrete and built that fantastic building on a less than perfect foundation. Now, people are moving out of that building. Lawsuits are being filed to see if the owners can get their money back. The plan of living in paradise has come to a screeching halt. Of course, they're asking the architects and the engineers and the construction workers why they would proceed to build such a fantastic and fantastically expensive building on a bad foundation. But they did. And now, as the years have gone by, the building is uninhabitable. Persons who thought they'd bought their way into paradise must now find someplace else to live for one simple reason. The building was built on a bad foundation. Now, as I watched that story, it occurred to me that that's not just a paradigm for architecture, for engineering, for construction. This is the same paradigm for living our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. This is the question that every Christian needs to ask him or herself. Is my life built on a firm foundation? Or am I trying to establish my life on things and on beliefs and on principles that really have no long-staying power? Hence the question for this sermon. Are you building your life? on a firm foundation. Now churches ought to be built on a firm foundation because churches can be at risk. If you watched not long ago, uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, France, caught on fire. And the fire damage was so extent that even the spire, the tallest steeple of that church, caught fire and came crashing down. 
Now, the church itself has still stood. It is built on a firm foundation of stone buried deep into the earth. But even if it had burned to the ground, the church is not really the buildings in which we live. Antioch Baptist Church is not really the structure on 89th and Cedar. Instead, the true church, the true community of faith, involves those people who voluntarily choose to gather together around a set of core values and a set of core beliefs and a set of core convictions and a set of core behavioral traits that bind them together as the church, whether they are inside the building or not. COVID-19 can keep the congregation from meeting inside of this building. What it cannot do is keep the church from meeting. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. They will know we are Christians by our love because our lives, not just our church building, but our lives are rooted in a firm foundation. And that foundation is irrespective of persons. The church includes people of all races, of all languages, of all genders, of all social status, of all nationalities, but they're still united because standing atop all of that are the essential and foundational beliefs that make us Christians. The question for today is, are you and I building our lives on those core foundational values? Now let's take a word that is popular in today's vocabulary. Evangelical Christians. I hear that word all the time. Evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians believe this. Evangelical Christians believe that. What in the world do they mean by an evangelical Christian? If you ask that question in the 1950s and before, I would say that an evangelical Christian is a person who believes in five essential belief patterns. One, they believe in the divinity of Jesus. Two, they believe in the authority of Scripture. Three, they believe in the sinful nature of humanity. Four, they believe that even though they have sinned, all of us can be redeemed from sin by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And five, they believe in the mission of the church to save the world. That's what it used to mean to be an evangelical Christian. Those were our core foundational values and beliefs until the last 20 years. And now, all of a sudden, to be an evangelical Christian is to have one view or another on issues of abortion or one view or another on the issues of homosexuality, as if those are the key issues in, involved in what it means to be a Christian. We cannot build our church on social principles like that because the views come and go and they're not universally agreed upon. Building your life on a firm foundation means building your life on the things that are fixed and established and do not alter because they came straight from the mouth of Christ into the ears of all of us who are the believers. So hear this conversation between Jesus and his followers about core beliefs. In Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says to his disciples, now follow this, who do men say that I am? Uh, in popular jargon, what's the word on the street about my identity? What are folks saying about Jesus? And they began to answer in various ways. Some of them said, well, some folks think that you are Elijah the prophet. Some say you are John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. All right, said Jesus, that's who they say I am. But they don't really know me. They have not walked with me. They have not spent any real time with me. So that's who they say I am. I want to ask you all now a very different question. Who do you say that I am? You, who I called to be my disciples, what do you say? 
you who have seen me heal the sick and raise the dead and give sight to the blind, you who've known me closely over all of these last three years, tell me, who do you say that I am? And all of a sudden, 11 of the 12 apostles have nothing to say. The only one who risks an answer is Peter. And Peter says, well, I think you are the Messiah. I think you are the Christ. I think you are the Son of God. I think you are the one for whom Israel had been waiting for the last 1,000 years. I don't know what's wrong with these other 11 folk, but I've got my, main, my mind made up. I say you are God's only son. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And I say, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because of what you have said, I'm going to build my church on you. I'm going to build my church on that foundation. But I want to press this now. What foundation? When Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on this foundation, did he really mean the person, Peter? Really? Peter? who not many days later, when confronted by an angry mob, would say to them, as Jesus had predicted, I don't even know who this man is. Now, of course, Peter knew who Jesus was. He was there when everything that Jesus did took place. He knew all about Jesus' identity. But when push came to shove and he had to stand up and declare his faith publicly, the rock named Peter crumbled in the sight of the least amount of resistance. Is that the rock upon which Jesus was building his church? No, I don't think so. I don't think that Christ said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, not the person Peter, but instead the proclamation of Peter. The, the thing upon which the church is built is not who Peter was, but what Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the one for whom Israel has been waiting, and that, my friends, is that upon which the church has been built all of these years. The foundation of the church is not necessarily inside a church building. It is not necessarily what we do on any particular occasion. It is the hope, the promise that resides in all of our hearts of who we say Jesus is. Who do you say Jesus is? There is no more important question for a Christian than that. What do you say about Jesus? Is he just a prophet? Is he just a wise teacher? Is he just a, a good rabbi? Is he some kind of miracle worker? Some, somebody who uses evil spirits to accomplish great things? Who do you say Jesus is? Don't go to sleep tonight until you've answered that question for yourself. Who do you say Jesus is? I did not ask you who your mother says Jesus is. I did not ask you who your spouse says Jesus is. I did not ask you who your parents or your children say Jesus is. I'm asking you, who do you say Jesus is? And if your answer is like Peter's answer, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then upon that rock and upon that promise and upon that certainty and upon that guarantee, the church of Jesus Christ will stand and last until time shall be no more. That's the good news of the gospel. God was in Christ reconciling the world to God's self 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. That's what I'm doing here. 
trying to make people believe that it makes a difference to put your faith in the man whose name was Jesus. Here Paul in Romans 10, verse 9. Hear the simplicity of the gospel. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now notice what the text does not include. It doesn't say if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and spend $59.99 on a prayer cloth that somebody has prayed over, and if you hold the prayer cloth up to the TV screen, all of your sicknesses will be taken away. That's not in the Bible. It doesn't say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and so $39.99 into this TV ministry and all of your problems will be solved. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and speak in other tongues, you shall be saved. No. There are no extra clauses. There are no additional steps. There is nothing that is human made that can be added on to the work of salvation that God has accomplished through Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, step one, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He died like we died. But after he was put in a borrowed grave, after two and one half days, God raised him from the dead, and that resurrection of Jesus is God's personal affirmation that everything Jesus came to say and do met with God's full and complete approval. And by the way, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Thanks be to God. If you confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But if you confess that Christ is Lord, you are in doing so renouncing allegiance to any other earthly entity. When you say Christ is Lord, what you are really saying is there's no higher authority, no greater power, nothing in which I put more faith, hope, or trust than in the word and the promise of God as rooted in the Bible. When this text was first written, if you confess and believe, if you confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord, that proclamation by itself could have gotten you killed. Because in the ancient Roman Empire, the Caesar thought that he was in charge, that he was Lord, that all allegiance had to go to him. And here came these Christians saying, no, you may have some power, but you don't have all power. You may have some glory, but you don't have all glory. You may have some earthly influence, but you don't have all influence. My confession is that not Caesar, but Christ is Lord. Oh, I may from time to time pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, but when I do that, I am not saying to myself that in my lowest moment, I expect anything associated with the flag to come to my rescue. If I get sick and go to the hospital, I'm not expecting a politician to come under the auspices of the flag and see about me because I've got something else in my back pocket about which I am sure I pledge my allegiance to Christ for three reasons. Hear these. And you tell me whether or not this is worth your allegiance. Number one, Christ lasts and lives forever. Where is Caesar now? Where are the pharaohs of Egypt? Where is uh, Adolf Hitler's thousand-year Reich? The sun 
used to not set on the British Empire. Where is the British Empire uh, today? And this country, for all of its power and all of its grandeur, we cannot get ourselves together well enough to fight back against a coronavirus because our president hadn't got any sense and folk are walking around not wearing masks and they're going to come and they're going to go. Nixon came and went. Bush came and went. Reagan came and went. Trump will come and go. Christ will last forever. Do not pledge your allegiance to things that come and go. Time is filled with swift transition. None of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. So the first reason to pledge allegiance to Christ is he lasts and lives forever. The second reason is that where you go, Christ goes. Christ is not locked up inside of some church building on some corner somewhere. You got to stay close to the building to be close to the Lord. No, no, he lives everywhere. There are these wonderful words that describe the characteristics of God. Omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipotent. He's got all power. And omnipresent. He is everywhere. He's not just going with you as you go. He's already there before you get there because he occupies every square space of the created order. In the beginning, God created. That means he's got sovereignty over the heavens and the earth. Any place I go, God's power, God's spirit, God's presence is already there Pledge your allegiance to somebody who lasts forever and somebody who lives everywhere you go. I don't care what life does to you. It does not cut you off from the presence of God. I have, as many of you have, spent a fair amount of time in the last few years locked up in ICU units. I never planned to be in an ICU unit. I just found myself there because this old earthly body had some aches and some pains and it needed some attention. And there were lots of times when I would be in that ICU and nobody could get to me. I'd be locked off for one reason or another. Or more recently, because of COVID-19, loved ones of ours that we can't go to see because of COVID infections, please understand, when you cannot get to the one you love, somebody who loves them even more than you love them can be with them and with you at the same time. What a joy. When I get sick and go to the hospital and I'm there, and my son Aaron is in New York City, and my wife Peggy is out someplace in a waiting room and can't quite get to me. I am not at the mercy of simply those hospital staff who also come and go. I've watched these folks do shifts. Uh, they work for eight hours and they go home. They work for four or five days and take two days off. They leave me right there in the hospital bed by myself, but I'm not by myself. I have a Lord who goes with me wherever I go. I've got a Lord who outlasts all other earthly powers. I'm just going to build my life on that firm foundation. But I got one more thing for you. Build your life on a foundation in Christ because he lasts forever. Build your life on the firm foundation of Christ because he goes wherever you go. He is present everywhere we could possibly be. And finally, build your life on someone whose love for us is universal. I got to say this during these political days. God is not an American. God doesn't have any particular predisposition to the American flag or the American creed or the American country. God did not just make America. God made everybody everywhere. And whether you like them or not, God loves the folk that you don't like.
because they are his children made in God's image. God's love is universal. I thought about that this week when I heard a United States senator from Arkansas, name is Tom Cotton, I guess maybe his ancestors owned my ancestors who picked his cotton. And he said slavery, quoting our founders, slavery, he said, was a necessary evil. I want you to just let those two words sink in your head. A United States senator quoting the founders of the country referring to the enslavement of our ancestors from 1619 until 1865 as a necessary evil. We didn't really want to do it, but we had to do it because we found in slavery the economic foundation upon which the country is built. Insurance companies like New York Life Insurance got rich by insuring slave ships and slave products and slave bodies without the enslavement of African people on this continent there would not be this great nation. It was, said Tom Cotton, a necessary evil. No evil is necessary. Evil is sinful. Evil is cruel. Evil is wicked. And anything that is built on a necessary evil like slavery that elevates some people and demeans others is being built on a weak foundation. And right now, right now, on the streets of America with all of these protests after the death of Ahmaud Arbery, after the death of Breonna Taylor, after the death of George Floyd, right now, all of those years of oppression and segregation and brutality are coming back to haunt this country because of our necessary evil. But God does not share in that agenda. I learned as a little child the most simple song with the biggest proclamation of faith. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in God's sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So God does not want us building our foundation on human cruelty. God wants the foundation of our country built on justice and not cruelty, on freedom and not incarceration, on quality education and not maximum security prisons, on science and truth and not on conspiracy theories and right-wing ideologies. Here's one for you. God wants our country built on this foundation of liberty and justice for all, and not just for those who are the friends of people in power. So I come back to the hymn I quoted earlier. But now I come to verse 2. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before God's throne on Christ. The solid rock I stand, not on flags, not on political parties, not on racial ideologies, not on class distinctions, not on cultural variables, not on any of that stuff that comes and goes, not on 50-story super luxury apartment buildings, on Christ the solid rock I stand. You know why? Because all other ground 
All other ground. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen.
As we come to the end of our time together, I hope that your soul has been nourished in these moments, that you have found comfort and reassurance, that you are not in this alone, but that we will get through this together, and that you have been empowered to work with others as we form a more just society. It's going to take all of us together. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. And may God hold you in the palm of God's hand this day and in the days ahead. Amen.